All right. All right. <laughs> but, are, but I guess we can still be recording in the practice session. Are we out of the practice session? I can't see. It looks like, well, Guilford's muted. It looks like we're now recording and out of the practice session. Okay. Because I know sometimes meetings are being recorded in the practice session. So, no, the, ours doesn't record in the practice session. Okay. That's good. All right. Go ahead, Mandy. Okay. Um, you know, I, I don't, we don't have another presentation prepared, um, but we are, we did go over some of the questions. Um, and I think, as I said in an email to Tracy, we don't have a new draft yet. We're set to uh, attend DAAC, or at least I'm set to attend DAAC next week. And, you know, Guilford has sent us some comments. Um, I'm going to try and talk to him tomorrow um about some of those comments and some more information and we're we're kind of waiting to gather everything before we create a new draft um so we're not sending too many drafts out to too many people um and and getting things confused but but you know most of the questions that that came from TAC we felt were related to where street lights go um not necessarily how bright are they or what's the shielding about them or things like that sort of the more technical aspects of our proposal and so we don't have answers for the placement because we've put that on hold what we did want to offer um, is we recognize that placement and where they go is not just a concern of a whole lot of people it's also very technical and very specific um, and we took our attempt when we created our proposal to do something based on um, the Dark Sky Association's recommendations on lighting zones and all of that. Um, but we are not by far the only people that should weigh into that. Um, certainly, it, it's clear that all of you are very interested in that. And so one thing we wanted to do was potentially offer um, we, we can't as a town council, even if we propose this to the town council, because the town council can't tell you what to do. Um, you know, we could maybe do something formally through the town manager, but, but one of the thoughts we had was this seems right up tax alley of something that they might be interested in um, working on. Um, and so we would be curious to see if this is something that TAC might be, in terms of the placement of where street lights should be. Um, irrespective of our proposal and the rest of the proposal, but where do we want streetlights in town? We were curious whether this is something that TAC might be interested in doing over, you know, not necessarily immediately, but over a long term and things like that. And if so, we would be happy to uh, work with you at least a little bit on that, um, but sort of seed some of that to you recognizing that you guys are the ones that have been advising everyone on things like transportation and pedestrians and bikes and streets and all. Um, so we wanted to put that out there. Um, I'm happy to hear from that before I go into some of the stuff that is not placement related, if people want to discuss that or respond to that before we talk about the sort of non-placement related questions that were out there. So I'll just respond briefly. Um, you are correct to that. And, and really the TAC is is only seeing the proposal we only saw the proposal for the first time you know a few weeks ago i mean i've been following the proposal personally since the summer when you first had the draft um but in terms of you know speaking in terms of the location of street lights um that it is true that you have removed the second part of the proposal where that is the focus for now and i think that's a good idea because there are so many um, important factors to consider with that. And I think using the zoning districts um, as a basis for that is pretty rough. And there's a lot of reasons why that might not be the best way to go. Um, but in our comments and in the comments that we sent um, to you before the meeting, I mean, we were looking at the parts, I feel like we were primarily looking at the parts of the first section that do deal with location. And so, like you've said that the second part is gone for now, but even within the first part, there's certain things about some of the language and so on about where streetlights are and where they are not. And so if that part is still moving forward, um, yes, I mean, TAC does care about that part and that's where we want to weigh in. Um, we didn't have discussions at the last meeting about the specific streetlight design, um, but I think in general, you know, we do recognize that some streetlights are better than others. 
and you know some street lights contribute unnecessarily to glare and they're not ideal and i mean just speaking for myself but also the committee is welcome to speak as well but i mean we do want to see good street lights design right so that my tendency would be to say don't take away street lights you know unless it's needed but that to have better street light design design that is meeting the safety needs and the other needs of people as well as goals such as the ones that you were putting forth with this new proposal in terms of like darker skies and things like that and there are some models around amish that work pretty well you know in terms of where street lights aren't unnecessarily bright and glaring and projecting the light everywhere and then there are examples that aren't so so i mean we do care about the location but that is still part of part one. Yeah, uh, let me clarify one of the things we've thought about that that Anna and I discussed about how to modify part one um, is we were actually thinking of proposing updates to the current policy that might update the purpose. Um, so that the next proposal, let me say the next draft, our current draft is a rescind and replace. The next draft might not be that. It might be changing select board to town council to recognize that update, updating maybe the purpose, and then removing section E from our part A that we're talking about sort of the technical standards, which is the placement standards because it's in the current thing, adding a sentence that sort of talks about um, place the uh, technical specifications in an appendix and then making our part A more of an appendix to the current policy. So basically not changing or proposing changes to the current policy, which is the placement standards, and then adding our part A as sort of the, the technical parts of part A um, as a sort of appendix to the current policy while updating the policy to reflect the change in government um, was sort of the approach I think we're gonna take the second, this next draft. Um, now that doesn't mean we can talk about the placement standards that are in the current policy, but that would that would not at this point that's sort of the idea we're going um, with potentially the next draft. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I guess if we are going to talk about different parts in detail, it is helpful maybe to pull them up on our screen in case not everybody has them and doesn't know which section is which as well as you do. Um, so does anybody else on the committee have any comments at this time? If not, I'll talk about some of the other specific comments. Um, I have one, I have one comment. Um, I think that, you know, um, we've thought, we've thought a lot about, and, and probably I've been on the committee the longest of anyone here. We've thought a lot about um, placement of streetlights and how it has to do with, you know, public safety as far as, um, streets so on crosswalks at intersections um less so about about like you know absolutely where street light should go and i mean that seems you know on long stretches of road that seems kind of arbitrary i mean i i feel like we have no expertise and that's probably the expertise of you know our public works director <laughs> um but as it particularly um, has to do with sidewalks, crosswalks, and um, intersections, I feel like that's something more in our purview. Tracy, what do you think about that? <laughs> because no. I'm uncomfortable like making a a, a a plan because I feel like it's not something we've real like you know guidelines for the whole town because I feel like that's not necessarily something that we've really we have expertise in nor have we really um thought too much about that per se sure. um so I think I I agree with you um on it I think that I do like the idea that Mandy's suggesting now about um you know putting some of the technical aspects in an appendix to section one and um maybe just updating the current streetlights policy the one from 2001 which actually guilford had a meeting the other day he actually said it's the 1991 policy more or less and it was just very literally tweaked a little bit in 2001. <laughs> Um, so it was originally introduced in 1991 when the town decided to turn off a number of the streetlights and there were questions about where streetlights would be located. Uh, so, I mean, I like that idea in general, but 
I mean, one of the things that one of my takes on that would be that um, I think, you know, if we're basically using a 30 year old policy that I would hope that we could look more at the purpose of it and how it's structured and some of the ideas. And one of the things, one of the parts that we were most concerned with um, when we had the discussion at the last TAC meeting was just that discussion, um, that section that was in section G in this new proposed policy, but just about how, you know, streetlights will not be provided by the town for pedestrians in residential neighborhoods unless at least one of the above criteria is met or the select board otherwise deems the situation to require a streetlight. So I think um, just that, I mean, I feel, I would hope that as a society, we've changed a lot, you know, in the last 30 years and that we want to be more supportive of uh, pedestrians in nighttime environments. And I would actually really like to see some language rewritten. And I, I had sent a model, you know, the model from Flagstaff, Arizona, which is both like a dark skies United community, but also one that has some languages about all the different um, goals and needs reflected in the streetlights policy. And I would really like ours to have some similar language. I mean, there are a number of models for that, just to recognize that, you know, in the last 30 years, I mean, currently pedestrian deaths in this country are at their highest level in over 40 years. And the last, I think since like 2014, the number of traffic um, pedestrian deaths at night has increased over 40% and things. And so these are some real risks. Um, I mean, we don't need to have all those kind of statistics in there, but just to sort of reflect, and we wanna be you know, a community that we encourage modes besides um, private vehicles. Um, and we also want to be an age-friendly community and so maybe have some language in there about how we really do want to support other modes and we realize you know that we want to you know preserve the natural environment as well we want so we want to do it in an intentional way and um, i would like to see language like that and if you're interested i can provide like a number of models for that but but the safety impacts i mean i have been you know since i originally saw this proposal i have read so much about safety impacts of um um, like the and safety risks of nighttime driving and nighttime pedestrian activities and um, in, in even you know the perception of safety like that can really affect um, whether people choose to walk or whether they get in their cars or whether they stay home and things like that too so all those things really matter and um, so I'm hoping that I mean maybe you would consider um, shifting in that direction um, so um, so, so I'll get into some of the questions that didn't deal with placement, and one of them was sort of that purpose thing that Tracy just talked about, and we will revisit the purpose. Uh, Tracy did provide some language from Flagstaff. We will look at that. We'll revisit it, especially with the new um, thinking we're going about how to present the next draft. We're going to relook at the purpose that's in the current policy and, you know, because our draft has it as a separate section. If it's in the, we have to figure out how that that new thinking works, but we're gonna relook at the purpose. Um, so that was one of the questions. We don't have language now that we'll do, but we've heard that the pedestrian and biking and all is um, a concern um, in terms of addressing some of that safety, the, the safety issues surrounding that with things at night. Um, the um there was a question about one street light per intersection and we said one um i think marcus you said maybe we could have at least one or something like that yeah we're gonna make a change to the language um we're not sure what we'll have it at we agree that some of the larger intersections might need more than one we're concerned that if we just had a language that said at least one some of the smaller intersections that only need one we might be adding lights where we don't necessarily need them so we just want to think a little more carefully about how to address the larger intersections that might need one without creating a, met, a method or a potentiality where they might be, where we might be over lighting and over providing lights at intersections that don't necessarily need more than one. Um, so, but, but we will address the concern of it just being right now written as you can only have one at every intersection. Um, well, well, and actually- yeah, Tracy. Actually, if you're going back to the language from the 2001 policy, it just says that streetlights will generally provided, be provided by the town as follows at intersections, right? And so it's left to the discretion of the DPW. 
on where those go. So, yeah. I mean, that you so. could just go back to that original language instead of saying one. Yep. Um, let's see some of the other ones. We're working on um, the cost to maintain and how are they maintained. We'll, we'll get some better answers from Guilford um, on that one. Oh, Joseph's got a hand up too. Just a quick question, uh, trying to read to the proposal. Uh, in terms of the light spectrum, the color, is it is it assumed to be either amber or white, or is that something that's left up to the discretion uh, later on? So the color spectrum is listed in the policy as no more than 2200 Kelvin. Um, which is a very, is, is yellow, is, you know, right now, I think most of our streetlights are 4,000 Kelvin, very blue, very white, um, and the policy brings it back much closer to a very yellow spectrum. Thanks. Um, let's see, there were, um, oh, there was questions about what happens when we don't own the utility poles, the current definition of I think light pole is those owned by us. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's light pole or street light. One of the definitions indicates that it has to be owned by the town. We need to go back to Guilford to figure out whether we can expand it to all street lights, whether or not owned by the town and how that would actually work, um, particularly with the Eversource ones, but also with others as I think sometimes there are uh, planning department or, or permits special permits or site plan reviews that have developers put street lights in um, on the public way um, as part of the sort of permitting process. And I'm not sure who actually owns some of them um, and things like that. So we just have to go back to Guilford and figure that out and clarify what we can do under the policy, what is the best option to do under that policy. And then we also have to figure out the um, issue with the 50 foot, the large, the much higher poles. We definitely don't want them installed higher. That presents a lot more problems with controlling the light, you know, the light trespass and the glare and, and all of it because you're now 20 extra feet high, right? And you're above much many more stories and all. So we have we just need to get more information about all of that and figure out how to address that or whether we can in the policy. Um, we might be able to get rid of the definition of light pollution that was in the policy completely because it's generally only used in sort of the pref the the sort of purpose statements. It's not really used as a um, definitional term when you get to the specifications. So I think that would take care of Tracy's your concern about the ambiguity that is that definition um, when it's not really used in the spec. So I think we can get rid of that definition um, and. The dimming questions, 70% um, is typically the, the choice. It's what um, uh, it's what Pepperell has chosen. Um, Sorry, which part, of the, which part of the response are you on? I'm just trying to follow you. So, so, so these were the questions that Anna typed up from last. Oh, okay. <laughs> So no, we had a, we we don't have access to what Anna had written up. So I had just yeah. sent my so own copy. Oh, yeah. But. So I guess we, if you have the minutes from the last meeting, maybe um, I was just taking rough notes for myself and Mandy. Oh. I, I was not anticipating sharing them with the committee. I was trying to note the questions that y'all asked um, from the from the meeting. Well, right. So, um, so that's what I would try to do too, Anna. Like I had listened to the meeting again and written up sort of the summary of our questions. That's what I sent yesterday. I think I called it like TAC comments based on the. Okay. February 16th proposal. Which and is, I, and that's what Mandy Joe was quoting in terms of the, the flag staff language and so on. Okay. And, but which um, part is that, Tracy? Which part are we on? So I'm just we're now on page two, section E. Yeah, section of, E. Of the document. Of my comments, yeah. Sentence. Okay, thank but, you. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, just, just going back to what, uh, Mandy, what you were just saying about the light, the polls, is that Guilford, at a previous meeting, Guilford mentioned that he that probably throughout town that Eversource owns about 85, 90% of the poles. Um, and he also said that some of the Eversource poles now are up to 60 feet high. Yeah. And then he explained, you know, how, which I was not familiar with, yeah. but like how there's all the different uses on the poles and they have to start at a certain height and be separated, you know, by at least a foot each and so on like that. I mean, I did have some questions about yeah. that in terms of why 
why do the street lights, you know, have to be at the top? <laughs> like, why can't they be in a different order? I mean, maybe that's a public a department of public utility question or something, because it is unfortunate that as the poles have been replaced, like all those street lights are being moved up when they yeah. were just fine for pedestrians and other traffic at their original level when the pole wasn't 50, 60 feet. So I noticed I, after he explained to us the last time, it's between like the third and the the third and the final line is where the um the street lights go. And that's the part that we own. That's I think we own any of it that right? we have we have access to we it. have <laughs> that's where the street lights go. Yeah. So because they have to be hooked up to the power line, which is the final line on the top, right, Guilford? On the poles that have three wires across the top, those three wires are primaries. So we're not hooked to those three wires. We're hooked to the next set of wires down, which are secondaries. For some streets, you only have secondary, you don't have primaries. So we're at the top of the pole because we do have to be attached to the secondary power source. And they don't want the secondary power source lines to cross the fiber for TV and the telephone and so forth. So that's why we're in that top part of the pole. Right. And they wouldn't lower us down. And they don't want the connecting line from the light post to cross the fiber either. Is that right? Because it? It, it is kind of loose and the wind can blow them and they could touch the other wires as well. <clears throat> Every wire has a spacing so they're not touching and they have a safety clearance. It's all geeky engineering stuff. Yeah. But enlightening. And now I now enlightening. I That's so great. <laughs> Okay. All right. So, uh, Mandy, so do you we want will to just have continue? to rethink yeah. that certainly with within the policy um, and all, because because the higher you go, the harder it is to shield. Yeah. The proper angle and all. Um, uh, is there a, actually uh, one thing? Sorry, Mandy. Is there a particular reason why they have increased the height of the poles? I think Guilford could answer that. Yeah, so, sorry, Guilford. Um, basically, because we pretty much unregulated everything. So it used to be you had a <laughs> power company that had a franchise in your community, a telephone company, and a Comcast and a cable company. Um, now they've kind of deregulated it, so you can have multiple telephone, multiple um, cable companies or not just a cable company, but an internet company. We have another internet company who just does internet uh, coming to Amherst. So a lot of the poll work that's being done now is to make the polls ready for that internet company. So it'd actually be Comcast, Verizon, and Go GoTel. I think their name is GoTel. Are they going to be fiber or are they going to be? The GoTel oh. is all fiber. Oh, sweet. So because more people want to be on the polls, um that is why they're making the poles bigger because of the safety requirements between yeah yeah oh well, you also don't want the electromagnetic interference either right so yeah sorry i've been ordered to stay on task so okay so dimming was another question um the policy as it is written right now dims all street lights the um I, I, I don't know the language we saw. I think it's only dimming the um, streetscape ones. Or maybe I'm wrong. No, I think I think it's written to dim everything but the ones with the but the street the ones near the village centers. Um, let let me find that section. So in your um, in your current bylaw the draft yep. i mean sorry the policy looking at like four right so yes. it says streetscape lighting right so, but the next, oh the and the other one right that's correct yes all other street lights yeah. shall be dimmed to no more than 70 yeah. percent by 11 p.m so the streetscape lighting which was right. defined sort of for the right. village centers and all mm -hmm. was the, was based on the bar or live music venue closure sure um and all of the other street lights that sort of aren't in those those areas um were based on an 11 p.m 
Um, Tracy, the information you sent us about sort of the accident data pretty much shows that most of the year 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. is the highest accident data. So maybe it would be wise for us to move that to midnight instead of 11 p.m. across town. Well, um, yeah, and I was also just thinking, I mean, one, we're in a college town, right? So the data I sent you is national data. And I have been downtown many times at midnight or after midnight, and there is a lot of activity there. And there's a lot of activity, you know, to and from the downtown as students walk, hopefully. Like I did the data I sent you, it also talks about how, you know, over, I think it was like 20 or 30% of the pedestrian deaths involve pedestrians who are above the legal limit for alcohol. And, yeah. and so the thing about that is, and, you know, we can have that in this town sometimes. Um, so the thing to, when I think about that, I'm thinking about like trying to protect people. Like I'm very glad that people who are intoxicated are not driving, but at the same time, you know, I want to hopefully, I want us to have policies that would help make them safer if they're choosing to walk streets late at night. And yeah. so, and the buses in, as I pointed out to like the PBTA buses, there are some routes and they run till 1 a.m. So yeah. everything in this town doesn't shut down at midnight. So. Right. And, and one of the things, you know, that the original placement standards we proposed that, that like I said, we're, we're going to revisit and, 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 you know, offer that to you too, um, talked about connector roads, um, you know, residential roads, connector roads, arterial roads. And, and when you look at what a connector and arterial road is, maybe we can talk about dimming on non-connector and arterial roads and keeping the connector and arterial roads sort of the main byways not dimmed. Like there might be another way beyond sort of, and then also talk about the village centers and stuff like that. Um, once you get rid of the placement standards, it becomes harder to uh, di differentiate between different parts of town in terms of dimming, um, but dimming does save money. Um, and one of the other reasons we were proposing this was to try and darken and eliminate the light trespass within residences while people are sleeping in particular, right? And so dimming has the benefit of if it if we can't solve the trespass issue, given some of these lights might be 50 feet up and be really hard to, um, dimming at least makes it less bright. So there might be other ways we can address that. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, a oh, number sorry. of the policies I've looked at um, use um, like road classification as a basis yeah. for helping decide like different types of lighting. Um, so that could be appropriate. Yeah, I mean, and, and we did that in the original policy, but we also had that road classification based on zones too for placement purposes too but but it was based on zoning districts right it was but, it was both actually right um, no it, much of it but um, much of it was was zoning district but then within that district was the road classified as collector or arterial or not sure, and sure. then there were different things there so yeah so we're certainly familiar with using that system and maybe and, the, and then some towns too i mean like for example the city of portland and oregon you know when when they're looking at street lights policy in placement, they also do like an equity analysis. They use their equity tool just to make sure that and you know no neighborhoods are being you know disadvantaged. Or, uh, and so, sorry, I mean, there's, there's, go ahead. Yeah, there's, uh, we're not talking about placement, right? We're not talking yeah, about placement. No, so the placement <laughs> is um, something we might do later at all. Right. Yeah. 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 I just want to keep us on task. Sorry. So, well, so dimming relates to sort of some of that though. And so we have to find a way without the placement issue, another way to talk about dimming. If, right. Because you can't relate it to what hit, we would have originally related it to where they are, those sort of lighting zones probably. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll we'll work on finding a way to, mm -hmm. to address the concerns regarding dimming and, and particularly pedestrian pathways that aren't in sort of our downtown and village centers. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, a useful resource for that could be the bicycle and pedestrian plan that we have that also that did identify, you know, priority networks that plan was finalized in 2019, except for the GIS maps. And um, we're still, TAC updated the maps, but the GIS has not yet been updated, but we will get that information to you as soon as we have it. Yep, we've been using and, and referencing it and we'll continue to do so. The version you have is out of date, but we will do our best. Yeah, to I know. Get it up. So, so, using so what we got. As far as dimming goes, I thought 
um, Guilford said that like doing that kind of fine tuning of individual lighting lights is very um, expensive and kind of complicated. Um, and I appreciate the fact because I literally have a light in front of our, our house that goes right into my bedroom and my daughter's bedroom. I appreciate the idea of doing that. I mean, it's the worst light ever. We can't see the stars. Like it goes right in our bedrooms. Um, but the practicality of it just seems like outside of real, real scope at the moment. So I, I'm interested in what you have you have to say, Mandy, Joe. Yeah, so we know that um, from Guilford's comments that, that cost might be an issue. And so we have not been able to have that conversation with Guilford about, do we put it in the policy? You know, you'd need to buy the controls and the controls are different and, and more costly than lights without controls, right? And so we have not had the conversation to make the final decision as to whether we would require the controls or whether we would just require the ability to buy the controls later. And that would certainly then reflect on whether our policy requires dimming or you know, sort of proactively says, if the controls are there, this is the dimming policy versus it must be dimmed. Um, we're, we haven't gotten there yet. So in the end, the dimming might look a little different because of those conversations that we're still working on having with Guilford. Well, well, and one thing that Guilford mentioned at one of the meetings I attended is that um, if you are going to be dimming lights, you know, one of the ways it can be done is basically it's almost like through an app type thing where you have that control, but you, then you also need to have a monthly subscription. And, um, and the town manager was talking to the district four meeting about just how many types of services now are changing to that monthly subscription model and how expensive that that can be. Um, yeah. So um, now one thing I was curious about, and I know you consulted quite a bit with um, James Lowenthal, but when you look at the Northampton um, streetlights policy, like there are things there on their webpage, they do allow people to request like right on the page, for example, if they want to add a streetlight or remove a streetlight or shield a streetlight. And so, I mean, is that something, and the town manager was saying that he does get a number of requests, you know, to remove a streetlight or add a streetlight or, so is that something that it might make sense for the town to have something similar here, like some, procedure that people could request, you know, if if there are certain circumstances that the local residents are very aware of more than just like the town broad policy to formalize it. And so, I mean, I know that, you know, one reason you came forward with this policy was that there had been specific resident concerns about specific streetlights. And so like in that vein, um, yeah, maybe, maybe that would make sense. So some policies have that, and Northampton certainly does. Some other ones we looked at have specifically um, ways to get streetlights added that don't comply with a policy. This is where the, the placement standards really come into effect, right? Yeah. Um, one concern we have with that, though, is um, similar to how we've started doing road repairs, where we take an objective measure of how bad a road is and then create a list of what needs repaired first that doesn't necessarily sort of creates a more equitable distribution of how to get a road on the list or how to make those decisions. They're done based on data and um, not necessarily based on resident complaint and the need to know who to complain to and and the need to know that, you know, how to work the system, basically. And so one concern we have with adding sort of a um, request to add streetlights to a policy like this from residents is that it, in some sense, we fear that it privileges those that know how to um, operate within the system versus those that might not know how to do that. And we would much rather set a policy and say, this is the policy and that's what we're going to follow across town than, than have a policy that says, well, if you complain enough or if you get enough people to say you want one, you'll get one because the reverse of that is, as Kimberly was just saying, she doesn't want one. Well, what if she doesn't want one, but her neighbor does want one? Yeah. What do you do? Right. You know, I have 
Kimberly's situation right in front of me. We don't want it, um, but maybe our neighbor does. And how do you then make that decision um, as to which one's there? And so we would much rather set a uniform policy than, and then stick to that policy, which is why those placement standards become very complicated and very involved and in depth in terms of getting it right, then the essentially the current policy we have that isn't hugely specific as to where you want them and therefore invites sort of inequitable placement, potential inequitable placement of streetlights throughout town. No, I, I think, I mean, I do appreciate, you know, trying to have a uniform policy and not just listening to you know, people who complain the loudest. I do think it is can be helpful to have um, options such as in Northampton where you can go to the website and request it because currently we don't have that. But as a town manager was saying at the district four meeting yesterday, like he does get a lot of requests, right? And so if you have a form and if you have something out there, it's different than having to contact the right people and do the right things. Um, and I do think too, I mean, one thing too, just to, I mean, uniform policies are good, but there's always gonna be like exceptions or special circumstances or something. So having as part of the formal policy, like some allowance for that, you know, similar to like the ZBA, that the ZBA allows you to consider um, when you don't wanna follow the zoning bylaw um, completely. And so, I mean, I, th I think it can, that was just an option, you know, for like circum special circumstances, because it can be to hard to have. Task. Go ahead. So, okay. What's the next point, Mandy? Um, it looks Mandy like I've covered most of them from the list, having paged yep. through it. Is yep. there anything that I particularly missed? No, I think so. One thing is, it sounds like you you are looking, you and Anna are looking at, um, you know, kind of overhauling this approach and maybe putting a lot of the details on the the technical aspects in an appendix and things. And so, um, could you tell us a little bit about when you see this coming back um, to TSO, and then you know, TAC could look at it again. Um, we, you know, and if you would the extent to it, like tax involvement. And also what what is most helpful? I mean, I could go ahead and I mean, I've written up some comments already, like we could go ahead and submit this to TSO, but if you're going to overhaul what you have currently, it probably doesn't make sense for TAC to spend much time commenting on something that's going to change a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think Anna could probably answer what TSO might want. Um, if we're going to overhaul it, you know, we'll have DAAC's thoughts on the current proposal next week. Um, Guilford and I sound like we're going to be able to touch base tomorrow. Um, for Anna's purpose, he he asked to call and said he has more information for us and I happen to have time tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to give him a call and, and then I'll update Anna on what he said. And so once we get all of that information, we'll start revising it. What I don't know is whether it'd be wise to take that revision back to TAC and DAAC before TSO or not. So I think that TSO has a lot on our plate right now. And so I think what would be most helpful in terms of TAC engagement is to really work with Mandy and I as sponsors on in terms of, of um, what things you'd like to see. I know the other thing, I, I apologize, I'm, I have TSO at seven, so I'm trying to uh, multitask and eat dinner at the same time. But um, the other thing that uh, had been brought up was including something about uh, revisions at certain time intervals. And so you know that was really helpful because Mandy and I missed it and so it was that's something that we'll put in whether it's five years or seven years we're figuring that out but um i think that's the kind of feedback that's very very helpful from tac is is specific things that you see missing and you know there there may be some points where we as sponsors don't agree with what tac recommends and i would absolutely ultimately if you wanted to include that in a in a memo to tso that would make sense but i think that it um my thought and i i will leave mandy to agree or disagree is that um, what's more helpful is us working with TAC to continue to edit the policy um, versus kind of writing our own policy, having gotten the input so far, and then having you write a memo that's totally separate. So, um, yeah, 
it's down the road a ways, I think, to come back to TSO, but I, we're hopeful to keep working with you all. And then we have also have a lot of other groups that we're still working to meet with. So um, Disability Access Advisory Committee, and um, as well as continuing to meet with Guilford, as well as meeting with um, members of, of, the, of APD. So we have plenty on our plate um, that'll continue to, to shift this as we go. And I may suggest too, that you may want to reach out to um, the people who've been working on the age-friendly and dementia-friendly work as, as Amherst wanted to be named an age-friendly and dementia-friendly community. I think it's through the planning department. Mar Maureen was leading that work. Um, I'm not sure. And maybe the Council on Aging. They've been the most involved as well as the planner from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Becky Bash. But just to see, I know that they do have in their draft final report, you know, some things related to transportation. So and, they, and then lighting. for full disclosure, we We've got an email. Um, I received an email from Chris Brestrup today, um, thinking about looping in the planning board to this process that I have responded to and CC'd Anna on, um, particularly since um, what we didn't realize until this morning when we were, it, it just didn't register. Not every every time you read a policy, it doesn't always register that that um, sometimes there are proposals from applicants that own private land where the the request and the approval has the addition of um, public way streetlights on it. And so what we do here would affect that. But but the ultimate, you know, part two or what might now be part three of what our original proposal was, was to get dark sky compliant technical things into the zoning bylaw. And so um, we might be bringing in the planning board into some of these conversations too, to make sure that whatever we do sort of conforms with that and, and work with them before we even potentially bring any type of zoning revision changes. Um, so that's another body we're going to have to potentially, if, if the planning board is um, receptive to, to be interfacing with too. That's, that sounds good. So I mean, there. I do have one question about, um, so when James Lowenthal made one of his presentations to TSO, right, and he was showing the light pollution around town, um, you know, obviously the biggest creator of light pollution in Amherst is UMass campus. And, um, and I've had friends even who live in Hatfield and all over the valley who say, hey, we can see the UMass campus, right? So, I mean, I realize that this wouldn't be part of the streetlights policy, but I mean, have the people who are concerned about light pollution, such as yourself, like in terms of interfacing with UMass on that, because it, there's just such a contrast between the UMass campus and say Amherst College, for example, right? Yes. Where it has so much... I've, talked, I've talked to some UMass um, people about it, mainly um, Tony Maroulis and Nancy Buffon um, about their concerns with it and the campus stuff. Um, James has talked to the astronomy folks and some of the other folks in at UMass is in UMass, you know, as professors and all. Um, we obviously can't force UMass to do anything, right? Um, some of that, though, some of the sort of peer pressure type things are Amherst adopting its own standards, Amherst adopting bylaws, um, and then the sort of advocacy from UMass professors and others that say, hey, Amherst did this, UMass get on board sort of thing. Um, and so that's much harder to do if we don't have a policy, right? And so we know we can't affect them directly by regulating them, but we're hopeful that some of the stuff we're working on here will result eventually in um, a change of policy at UMass to to at least the the dark sky sort of shielding, no up lighting, things like that, that, you know, and, and color temperatures um, that they might adopt some of that if if we start doing it as a town. Yeah. And then, uh, sorry, I would just be curious because uh, to me, UMass is pretty much in line with a lot of, you know, with most state colleges around the country. Having gone through a similar exercise at Georgia Tech um, where, you know, lighting, the aim was to get lighting to where UMass is. Just because Amherst College is less does not mean that UMass is not following, you know, a guideline. Um, you, Amherst College is a private university, a private college, can pretty much do what it wants. I would, you know, as you're going into that, I think you probably need to be aware of standards 
at other public institutions around the country. So. Yeah, thank you. And a little bit in a similar vein, just in terms of like, I know one thing that Flagstaff has done is that they also have um, design guidelines and restrictions on uh, commercial lighting and things on private lighting. Um, and I know, for example, on my own street that right, a lot of the lighting at night is not street light lighting. It's a combination of the street lights and people's homes and things. And um, yes, yeah, and and that's where the second, what was originally the second part of our proposal that was the zoning tackling the zoning issues, which would then apply to everything but the public way, right? Um, and all of those, um, we had made the decision to start with street lights because we did not know how receptive the town council would be to the technical specifications and. Um, drafting a street light policy seemed a little easier and less um, less technical, although it, it's still quite technical than trying to figure out how to get that into a zoning bylaw. Um, and then with all the requirements that a zoning bylaw comes with in terms of hearings and all of that and time deadlines, uh, starting with a street light policy seemed the more logical way to go. If it didn't get support, we won't have had to have, we, we wouldn't be applying for any zoning changes if, if a streetlight policy that only needs seven votes doesn't get support, right? And so so that, that's why I said it, it seems like there is support for this on the council. Um, whether or not it passes, we obviously don't know till a vote, but it has been generally well received such that it is probably time to at least start involving the planning board in looking at these because you don't want to pass. The other thing is you don't want to pass a streetlight policy that has different specifications potentially than the zoning bylaw. You, you probably want them to agree. And so we want to make sure that whatever we're doing can be done. The, the ultimate goal is townwide, not just on streetlights. That's right. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you both for coming. And for these updates, these are some big updates. So um, I guess we look forward, you know, we typically, TAC typically meets twice a month, sometimes we meet once a month. And when you feel ready, I think Myra wants to speak, but um, but when you feel ready, you can come back to us. But Myra, do you have any comments? You're currently on mute, Myra. Mute. Yeah, I um, thank you for letting me speak, Tracy. I, I'm not going to say very much, except this conversation has been really enlightening, and I don't mean the pun. Um, I, I have heard at the TAC meetings in the past, and I know that it is very important to the TAC, uh, the pedestrian safety, bicyclist safety, um, but I'm not hearing that so much in the bylaw presentation. And I'm hearing about uh, astronomy and I'm hearing about the way that things are supposed to be constructed. And I totally support doing as much as we can but I also want you to think about as presenters, there are some very dark streets, for example, Hills Road, it's a little road, goes almost nowhere. It's um, in neighborhood residence, has very few lights. It is so dangerous because of potholes that if you don't have any lighting on that street, anyone riding a bike, anyone walking is imperiled. If they, you know, you, you have to put the conditions of the of the roads and the sidewalk into consideration here. If everything were perfect, it might be a little bit different from the safety point of view, but it wouldn't be safer for women alone and it wouldn't be safer for people who uh, don't see as well as they used to. And it wouldn't be safer for a lot of people who really do need to walk. And as far as uh, parity for people in different income groups, it's actually, I think, people in lower income groups who need the street lights more because fewer of them by percentage own cars. And so they are walking and they are riding bikes and they need protection as much as people, uh, you know, as other people. And I just, I haven't heard enough of that from the presentation. And so that's what I want you to keep in mind when you speak to Guilford or Anna tomorrow, because I think I think that this is not a perfect world, and there are some real dangers out there as far as um, you know encounters with other people and encounters with 
extremely bad roads and sidewalks in some places. That's that's really all I want to say. That's thank you, Myrna and Andy. I'll, I, I I completely agree with you. And Andy, Myra. Yeah, uh, uh, Myra just raised an interesting question, and I'll. Uh, um, I think I can say this uh, consistent with my role as uh, liaison. Um, she was citing a private way, I believe, that's not an accepted public way. And it raises a question that the co-sponsors may need to talk with Guilford about and uh, consider for other perspectives. And that is, um, how does this uh, proposed policy apply to public ways? and private in roads that are not public ways. I had no idea that Hills Road is not a public way. I think yeah, it not, is a I think it is a public way. It goes but, from Strong Street to Redgate Lane. It's like a real road. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, I was thinking of some of the roads like the hollows and some of those areas are definitely not public ways. You know, and no, also I think that Hills is public. No exceptions Having no exceptions um, is very dangerous. I think that no, nothing should be written without a Northampton type. It doesn't have to be that one, but possibility for people to make requests based on things that couldn't be foreseen in a blanket policy that has no exception. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Sorry. Um, so I think, um, does anybody else on the committee have any other comments for our counselors at this time? Um, I just want to add that I completely agree with um, Myra's um, exception and, and really thinking more critically about this policy. And um, I also just want to add that I'm headed to the high school where to help out with the um, musical tonight because no, the teachers, you know, they're not helping out at all. And um, and there are no ushers, there's no ticketing. I'm going to help. I'm, I'm part of the Friends of the Performing Arts. I'm gonna go help there tonight. If anyone else is going to the musical or thinking about it, help out because none of the teachers are rightly, I believe helping and we are in critical need. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you. So um, Anna and Mandy, so just, you know, keep us in the loop as this evolves and we'd be happy to have uh, you back and have other conversations. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. All right, so we still have a quorum and we'd like to wrap up by seven. Um, I did, just before we move on to other items, I did just have a comment just on lighting that it didn't seem necessarily so relevant to have with the counselors, but um, but the question that had come up that um, Stefan brought up last time about just lighting at the PVTA bus stops. And I know when I had done um, the district four walk around the neighborhood, there. There was a bus stop on East Pleasant Street with a bus shelter, and you really could not see it at all at night. And I don't know whether there are plans to improve the lighting at some of the bus stops or flexibility or funding to do so. But, you know, just in terms of accessibility and things, that seems like that could be really important. Um, Stefan, do you have any comments? You said you're back working at UMass Transit. Yeah, um, I don't know. I know which we talked about. I think it's the bus stop on the corner of Chestnut Street. There. Right, that was the one, yeah. Correct. So that one, yeah, it is pretty dark. Um, especially from a driver's perspective, you really got to slow down, turn your high beams on, which can obviously be uh, not, you know, you, you sometimes you can't turn your high beams on if there's obviously cars approaching. But you had also just mentioned like around town, right, that there are the LED like flashers that people can, but just. Correct. I don't know if, I don't think that one has it, Chestnut, but some okay. definitely do have it. Some okay. of the more rural spots do have it, um, which is definitely helpful. Uh, it is a flasher kind of turns on even on campus. There's some, which honestly, I think are less, un less necessary just because campus, like we said, is well lit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I saw that, uh, I was just going to point out, maybe I should have said this when the council was wrong, but I guess I'll, it doesn't hurt to say now. I, I did notice the, um, the one of the things, one of the files you sent, I forget which one it was. I think it was the, um, 
the memo that was sent out by um by the counselors originally yeah yeah it was august 2022 so last year and uh it doesn't really i know you already touched on this so not sound like a broken record but i know it doesn't really touch on a lot of impacts of safety whether positive or negative of, of their proposed policy so i just want to like I don't know. I was hoping they could also, I, I know you already mentioned this, but they yeah. can go I mean, further into that. No, definitely. I mean, that's why I wanted them to revisit the purpose. So I, as mm-hmm. I said at the start of the meeting, this wasn't referred to TAC until recently, but mm-hmm. I myself have been following the policy all along. And in their initial presentation, um, they, sit, they say very little about, they talk a lot about the safe, the health the human health impacts of like too much lighting mm-hmm. and the environmental impacts, but there was very little attention paid to um, the transportation safety implications. Yeah. And and from the very beginning, I had suggested to them that they balance some of the dark sky goals with mm-hmm. other town goals, you know, such as better transportation safety, better transportation access, being right. an age-friendly community and things like that. So, but what I'm hearing from them when they came today mm-hmm. is that they are, I mean, they they may be looking at some of that. So I appreciate that. And and there are a number yeah. of models of communities that have more language to that. So I'd love to see that added to the proposed policy. Right. Yeah. And I think I think uh they had some images in that memo, the August 2022 memo to the town council, uh, that show that talked about like you saw like the before and after images. And obviously you have like a soft cutoff in the before image with the lighting and then a hard cutoff with the after. And you notice in some of them, again, it could be exaggerated. So I guess take it with a grain of salt. It could just be purely an example and not representative of what would happen here in our town. But you don't really see beyond that cutoff, which I know is kind of the point. But at the same time, like it's totally pitch black. So it's like, uh, like in one of them, it's like a parking lot, I think, and the 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 street lighting is alongside where the front of the car would be, I guess, in the parking spot. And you don't see and there's like shrubbery or bushes in the back. You don't really see anything there. So I think it's important to not just like kind of paint out with the brush and say okay well this lighting this neighborhood or this section of town has a lot of light pollution let's just put this one type of lighting it's like well okay well what about other aspects around like like you said like crosswalks uh, you know if, if it's if it's a street where people are allowed to uh, parallel park on street parking mm-hmm. yeah. you need to make sure it, there is some quote-unquote i don't know if you call it spillage so you can see what's coming between the cars people walking out even if they're not supposed to it's going to happen so i just I, what i'm saying i guess is I don't think we should have a kind of one size fits all no. approach. Every well, and, part of Amherst. And in the bus stops too, like I had mentioned to them, because the dimming idea has been in the proposal since the beginning, mm-hmm. right? To dim lights, everything at 11. But again, we are a college town. And right. I was concerned about people who are still in the bus buses. And you've yeah. mentioned how bus stops aren't always well lit, but then you have the people get off the bus. Right. And you have the last mile when they have to get home from the bus. Exactly. Right. And um, yeah. and some of the guidance is, I mean, Federal Highway uh, is spending a lot of energy on this just because of all the crashes that do happen at night. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a quarter of all driving is done at night, but 50 mm-hmm. percent of the crashes, like the fatal fatalities happen at night. Um, yeah. And so I was at a, you know, a virtual summit a few weeks ago. And over and over again, they said, you know, 75% of pedestrian deaths happen at night and, you know, 50% of fatal crashes happen. I mean, there's, right. they're just, they're really focused on that and how do you design better intersections and better mm-hmm. um, crosswalks and just to, you know, cut down on those deaths. So, um, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm hoping that they can pull in like some of that, those, that information because there's a lot of it out there. So. Yeah, and I think with Amherst being unique in that it being a college town with not just not just a college town, but a college town with the university that's a very large population. Mm-hmm. Obviously, not everyone lives in Amherst. You, know, you have Belchtown, Sunderland, what have right, you. Right, have right. Sure. But like, still a lot of people live on campus and off campus. And those on-campus people, I know we're not concerned with on-campus because that's UMass, but at the same time, those people spill into town. Mm-hmm. And I think, so looking at these statistics that you're talking about, that obviously applies to Amherst. But honestly, I would argue even more so because uh, it there are people and there are a lot of drunk people and going to parties and whatnot, leaving campus, coming to campus, um, living here. So I think with that influx, uh, you know, it's obviously mu- the majority of the year, obviously the summer's uh, a different right. kind of animal. Everyone, most people go home, but still, I think that's also kind of, we should weigh it more that way as well, I think. Well, and that's why I mentioned too, right, that a large, I mean, a sizable percentage of the people who are killed the pedestrians mm-hmm. who are killed each year nationally are pedestrians who are intoxicated. 
right? right? So again, you want them to be getting home safely. You're glad they're not driving, but you don't want anything to happen to them. And and actually right. in some communities too, um, I've been looking at some of the crash data statewide um, that mm -hmm. Walk Boston works with, which is from the Mass DOT like crash database. Mm -hmm. But um, in some places, some cities are reporting actually um, that there are quite a few of the people who were killed in pedestrian crashes Mm -hmm. with you know cars and pedestrian are people who don't have homes mm -hmm. and so again that's another vulnerable population i mean it it makes sense that their numbers would be higher because they're out on the streets the most they're walking around late at night and things like that mm -hmm. um but again you want to protect you want to protect the populations who that can happen to or people um like um of the um, in the in recent years in amherst there have been five fatal pedestrian crashes and mm -hmm. four of them have been at night. And mm -hmm. most of those have been in places that don't have much light um, or and mm -hmm. don't have sidewalks. Uh, so like, right, I mean, it came up at the last meeting that there was the one on Northeast Street where the UMass student was walking late at night and was killed. Mm -hmm. um, and there was the one at the bus stop on North Pleasant mm -hmm. Street, north of campus, where that person mm -hmm. wasn't seen and that was at night. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was the one at UMass you know, when the sidewalk was closed right. and the conditions were, you know, rainy and so on. And again, I mean, those are lighting issues and mm -hmm. lack of sidewalk issues and things like that. So you mm -hmm. have to think about it, you know, from the broader perspective. Right. And bicyclists too, because bicyclists obviously right. kind of below. And then, right, and then I mean, them. Hadley has had um, pedestrian deaths too of people walking late at night along Bay Road, for example. Again, mm -hmm. very little lighting, no sidewalks and so on. So it happens. Right. It happens for people who work these late shifts. Right. And, and there's a lot of streets in Amherst that don't have sidewalks. So, yeah, yep, definitely. So, um, Joe, yeah, did you have a comment? A, yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah, I was just thinking a lot about what you're saying as a student that I'm often leaving the library at 1 a.m. And there's like a large group of students that are walking into town <laughs> uh, at that time. And they're not intoxicated, but there are plenty of intoxicated students. So, yeah, the timing wise, the dimming, uh, I don't know how effective that would be for the costs of what it would cost. But then also like the actual, there's so many other factors of why pedestrians get killed. And a lot of it has to do with what you were just saying, like the flow of traffic is, can be kind of poor in town and there's lack of like reflection and, and whatnot. So, but uh, Amherst College is doing their walkthrough, I think after break about the lighting. So if you have- Oh, that's great, yeah. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do have, I did have a comment about Amherst College. I, I'll, I'll send you an email. Well, actually, so one thing is, I'll just say it right here, but I mean, I have been really impressed at how Amherst College is doing the lighting. But one thing I've noticed, um, because at the end of my street, there's the big Amherst College fields on Route 9, and that sometimes those lights seem to be like they're on all night, or they're on much later than there's any teams using them. And so I was just wondering, you know, sort of how that works. That, yeah, so they, they've been so. responding recently to especially a lot of uh women students walking home late at night requesting that and i think that's for lack of appropriate lighting to make up for having like the stadium light on there are just some very dark areas of campus uh where a lot of students feel unsafe uh walking to their dorms and i think that probably goes for umass as well so i think that i think you don't you know i think their emergency response is to Whatever, whatever lights they have on, but I don't. Yeah, but I just meant like, I mean, the UMass fields on Route Nine, right? They're not in the center of campus, but and they do. They are very tall, and there is a. They do have a lot of light, and so I'm not sure they all but, need uh, to be on all night. <laughs> oh, oh, at UMass, yeah, they. No, I mean, sorry, the Amherst. I'm sorry, the Amherst College fields yeah. on Route Nine. I could, I'll bring I that up though. I, I mean, just because it seems like, I mean, there are nights where it's darker there, but then there's just nights where it's definitely not. So, yeah. They might have just forgot to turn it on. And I think, you know, the safety, well, that could be too, but I wonder if they could be sort of set on like some automatic <laughs> timer. No, that's not, a, that's not an on. intentional thing. I mean, so. you know, any of those stadium nights, you got to turn a key to turn them on and someone's just gone ahead and turned them on and forgotten them to turn them off. Right. But I think it's interesting, Joe, that you're saying that there are concerns from students about the level of lighting at MS College or the lack thereof. Uh, so we could potentially see the level of lighting increasing. 
right? Um, it's you well, know, it's I mean, that's that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, the situation. I mean, that's what mm-hmm. we you know go back to fifteen, whenever millions of years ago it was. As a Georgia Tech, we went through that whole exercise of identifying the dark spots, you know, lighting it up like it was, you know, sunlight outside sort of thing because of the very issue. People don't feel safe walking back to their dorms or to wherever at the hours that you're talking about, you know, one, two, whatever they get out of the library. So that's, you know, Amherst College might be dark now, but it's unlikely to stay that way. So. We'll, see. well, and I think so during the presentation that Anna and Mandy made in August, um, they did, you know, cite research that shows that having increased lighting actually does not have a, does it, not reduce not light, does not yeah. reduce nighttime crime. But the thing is, there's actually studies that do show that it can have, um, it can reduce crime. I mean, there is a situation where if you have something very well lit, like for example, say a very large parking lot and your car, you know, happens to be in the middle of it late at night and there's no other cars around, right? Having all that lighting in some ways sort of exposes you more because everybody can see you're there and so on. And it can, it, you can see that you're all the, alone. Yeah, but, it's not about the research, it's about how you feel. No, but that's and what that, I was gonna say thing, too. I you mean, know. one of the things that they found is that, I mean, right, if you're, if you have, if you have areas with much less night lighting, you know, for example, and we are as a town, right, trying to encourage more alternative modes. The question is, if the streetlights are turned off in your neighborhood or dimmed in your neighborhood, like, will people still go out and walk for an errand or will they feel like they have to get in their car? And the same with some older people. I mean, one of the things from the older, the age-friendly study is that some people just say certain areas are too dark at night, right? So is that and encourage them to I mean there's you know there's all these other impacts too but I mean the fact is that regardless and the research again is mixed with some saying that lighting is a positive impact on reducing crime and some saying it doesn't but um but there's also the impact about how people feel and what decisions they make and are these friendly places and I mean that's why I included that um Flagstaff bylaw for one example just because it's showing right that you want to create like a friendly environment, you want to create a place where people want to be, particularly in the downtown, like as Joe says, right, he sees people walking downtown at like 1am. And so like, if mm-hmm. you dimmed all the lights, are you not going to have anybody coming downtown then or whatever? I'm so about some of the other examples, like Lewiston, Maine, I know they receive a lot of secondary migration for the intent purpose of safety. So I'd be curious if there is information about the transition to these dark skies kind of thing that mm. in the east. So wait, can you say can you say what yeah, you mean so, about uh, that? For example, Lewiston, Maine is, you know, uh where Bates is, but there's also a large uh Somali community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they mm. receive a lot of secondary migration from from Portland and oh. other places where people feel unsafe. Okay. And the number one prime reason for a lot of these towns in Maine that they were citing for people moving in is safety. So I'd be curious and I'm happy to look around for data as well if there's any data to support um the effect of of the dark dark sky kind of initiatives that they were citing Mm -hmm. uh, for that um in an area that i think too would be useful for the counselors um to talk about in in amherst Mm -hmm. yeah no I'd, i'd be happy to look at some of that i might have some of that information already okay so it is now um 6 44 and um, so one of the things I had wanted to do is talk about um, what's happening in terms of like the road projects and the sidewalk projects for this year coming up. Uh, there was a preliminary list that the town manager was sharing at the district four meeting that came from, I don't know if you, if everybody was on our committee then, but back in the spring, the, um, the the um the dpw had had like um a vehicle that went around and assessed all the road conditions um you know using some like automation and um and automate and evaluate and they used the those those findings to decide which streets to prioritize for for pavement um improvements first and pavement maintenance first 
And um, what the what the town manager was presenting was suggesting that that's sort of like the main list still. And then Guilford, if can you uh, just uh, chime in? Is that still your sort of main list? That's or the, um, the projects, the basis? That's the base list for doing. Okay. So I can send that around. I wasn't sure how in date it was. So there was one slide that showed like 2022, and then there was one slide that showed 2023. Um, and so is that still, did you do all the 2022 ones in 2022 or? No. Cause it sounded like actually, and he was talking to just about how the money runs out much faster <laughs> than you would hope. So it sounds like you may still be doing the 2022 list. Would that um, be accurate? Or? I have to see what list you're actually holding. Okay. Um, I can, um, I can I can pull up the one that he was sharing yesterday and you can tell me if it looks right. Hold on. And then um, the other quick update I had was just on the snow and ice bylaw, which is being reviewed by GOL and it went to the council and it came back and it's going to be the name's going to be changed so it's not just about snow and ice but that it's also about other types of obstructions in the public way including when there's like hedges and bushes and trees that get into the public way um and i know in the areas that i walk there are certain um properties that their bushes go way way into the sidewalk um so i think that those are all great changes um it was reviewed preliminarily already by the council and they got some feedback and uh, I know the tree warden requested some changes and there's some other tweaks they're making it's going to come back to so we could um I can send that around but actually I guess we should wait until um and Mandy Johanneke is working on that as well so once they have the latest draft I can um share that with everyone and um okay let me just pull up this other slide and if anybody has anything else that they wanted to um bring up feel free oh very nice very nice yeah so i i attended a webinar today i mean a seminar today at the umass campus and uh the speaker's spouse brought their infant and i thought and this is maybe true with your child too joe it's the first of many webinars and seminars that your child will be going to <laughs> in their young life she's already very familiar with the technology and she can turn the tv on on her own she figured that out mm -hmm. wow <laughs> we're like uh oh let's hide the cell phone because i too um subjected my kid to too many webinars and seminars and stuff let's see let me just look at this all right just trying to pull this up um okay share okay. all right so can you guys see this so this is um you can just see my pdf right now my whole screen so this is what um guilford had gone over this with us previously it was a great presentation and um what the town manager was showing so this is how they had this vehicle that went around and collected all the pavement condition data and you know which ones are good and which ones are not good and then they used it you know they had the worst the worst streets based on that evaluation and a summary of which streets have been resurfaced and then there were these this list of projects about for the projects that would be rehabbed and reconstructed so i don't know guilford of how accurate this is compared to what happened in 2022 yeah, that's what that was what was done in 2022 except for um Pomeroy Lane and, and Kellogg Avenue. Okay. But now Kellogg is happening this year, is that right? Yeah, it moved to this year. Okay. Got it. So you did all these other projects, so that's yep. Great. And then the one and then he showed and then he did some crack, crack ceiling and the sidewalk replacements. I think all of these were done. Is that right? The yes. Taylor Gray McClellan. McClellan looks great, by the way. 
Walk it all the time. It's, it's, it's right Amity. near Joe's house, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the <laughs> Amity work looks great too. Um, and then here was the list for 2023. And um, that he shared. So I again I didn't yes. know how accurate this was. Well, College Street's coming off. Okay. Um I think old farms coming off. Um, College Street's coming off because it's state or because it's ours or what? Uh College Street's coming off because we actually may have this really huge project in the next two, three years. Oh. Interesting. Um, we may do we may do the part um, we may do part of it, but from the substation on College Street back up to South Pleasant Street is probably definitely not getting done this year. Um, there's a couple more that may not on the yeah. that may be off. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm so I'm gonna stop sharing. So um, one of the things we have wanted to talk about for a few uh, meetings, um, a few of which um, Guilford wasn't able to attend and Jason was here instead, is just that overall, you know, ongoing list about tax priority projects and so on and Guilford's um, spreadsheet of the requests that he's been receiving. So I'm hoping that we can review that at our next meeting and then just talk about that. I mean, it was good to see we did when we talked about it when Jason was um, at our meeting. Is that you know the town has made progress on a lot of the um, projects that were the most important to tack. So it's nice to be able to check some things off or at least see that they're in progress. And so that that seems like a good topic for next time. I mean, does anybody have any other you know sort of key agenda items? I also do want to get back to the um, the bicycle and pedestrian um priority networks plan um there were you know a few people who've been asking about that and um the planning board has been interested in that too and Anna mentioned too tonight right that they have been using the older version of the map as a basis for their some of their thinking on where lighting should be um okay so I think so we had agreed at our last meeting that we'd have our next meeting in two weeks so right next week is the UMass spring break and then we'll be back. So I'm hoping everybody can make it then. And I'm not sure um, what happened with Christine Lindstrom because I wasn't aware that she wasn't able to attend tonight. And does anybody have any announcements or anything? You gonna do minutes? Oh, minutes. I don't know. I We do want to end on time, not to bother Amber. I, 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 move, <laughs> I move that we accept the minutes as presented. We oh, haven't presented as, as, as emailed to us. Sorry, I'm going to give it my other computer. Really? Yeah. Has Has everybody read them? Yeah. Okay. Twice. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't know. I I haven't looked at them yet, so I guess I'd prefer that we wait, and then hopefully we'll have her meetings from last meeting and this meeting too we can just do them we'll put that first on the agenda we'll just do all the meetings okay all the minutes i would that would be my preference i withdraw my motion then no thank you marcus um so i did have two things i was just going to share um via email after the meeting so that we could call these announcements but um one there was a really nice piece that i saw online about the work that um tate's class has been doing with the pdta and the progress of some of those plans, you know, and looking at the overall transit plans. Um, so I'll share that. And then I also just want to share, I, I don't know whether we've talked about that. I don't think we've talked about this yet as a committee, but there was that one of the last things that Governor Baker did before leaving office was he signed the act to reduce traffic fatalities, um, which, you know, has a number of changes designed to uh, make roads safer, make roads safer for everyone, um, particularly vulnerable um, road users such as pedestrians, bicyclists, and you know tractors and so on. Anyway, so um, there is Mass Bike is having a webinar next week about the law, um, and there's also Joe Comerford, our senator, has also sent around some basic information about it. Some of which her comments, she also refers people to. Um, Senator Will uh, Brownsberger, who was instrumental in putting the law together and 
making it happen. I knew for some of the advocates and the safety professionals who've been working on the act to reduce traffic fatalities, it's been in the work for at least like 10 or 15 years. Um, so they were glad to see it passed. And so I'm going to send it around that. I'll send around that information on that. And I hope that we can talk about it more at another time too. Um, some members of the town council were asking me about it. Uh, and I'm planning to go to the mass bike webinar just to get an update on the law. But it's next, uh, it's on March 13th. So anyway, so those are, those aren't really announcements, but I will be hitting you up with one more email with some of these links. And also I know too that the, um, sorry, one more. And I know too that the Western Mass Rail proposal is moving forward as well. And when Joe Comerford um, was speaking with the town council on Monday night, she mentioned that and like an upcoming meeting on that too, to try to make it, you know, try to continue to advance that project. So maybe in this email I send, I'll also send a link to that. So, okay. I think we're all good. We're all good. All right. Okay. Thank you all. And we will see you on the 13th, on the 23rd. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you, Gilford. Thank you. Right. Take care. Thanks. Bye.